welcome. This is exciting because this is really our kind of our first uh, in-person uh, event, and, and, and lots actually lots more folks are on Zoom, so so hello. We're we're kind of just getting used to getting back to learning and talking and being together in person with all of our masks and wall open and all, all those those precautions. But we're sort of creeping back into it. So thanks for um, for for being the Nachshon here. Um, we're also, I want to say, uh, with this event, um, R- Rabbi Daniel Roth, who I'm about to introduce, is, is kicking off for us our new season of learning, our new kind of semester of learning, if you will. Um, and this year, um, we are using, this year is a Shemitah year in the Jewish calendar. Uh, the Shemitah year that we're, we're, every seven years, the, the land, we're told to let the land lay fallow, the land of Israel lay fallow. And, um, and so there's an agricultural element to it, but there's a theological element to it as well. We do that because it's God's land and not ours. And then there's also a, a justice element to it, that in this, as part of what happens in this cycle is that, um, and especially in the seven times seven, um, every, every, every jubilee year, um, all, 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 all slaves, all servants, all, all people in bondage are released, and everybody returns to their original um, homestead. So with all of those elements floating uh, uh, around in the Shemitah category, um, we, uh, we joined together with, uh, with our, our partners in the Gen Network to, to really focus this year's learning um, under the rubric of, of Shemitah and, and use it to think about um, some of those core themes that are, that are raised by the, by the whole institution of Shemitah. And, um, and so themes of, of land itself, thinking about agriculture and land itself and and, uh, and, and, and of course, one of the great themes is thinking about the land of Israel. Like what, is, what is distinct, what is special about this land? And so we're, 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 we were wanting to do a lot of thinking and, and uh, learning around Israel because, of, of course, it's also uh, now, nowadays has so many other um, meanings and political meanings and, 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 and so, so many difficulties um, in, in thinking through everything that Israel means to us and to, to many peoples in the world. Um, so we were trying to think of the right people to lead us through that conversation because, as you know, that is such a difficult conversation to have. And, um, and the, the person that we, that we kind of found and got excited about actually in some ways was in some ways, is right in our own backyard. And I'll get to that at the end. I want to just first formally introduce Rabbi Daniel Roth, who is the director of Mosaica, the Religious Peace Initiative. And, um, and the work that, that he does um, in, in Mosaica, it, I'm not going to explain because that's, that's what he's here for today, is to explain, but, but, but it's called third-party third um, negotiation, um, religious third-party negotiation. That is, religious figures who are trying to make... Uh, to, to negotiate peace in major international conflict. But when we, th- we, I think, associate religion with peacemaking, but we think of people marching in the streets and peace now, and, you know, and that's my, the, the, the prophet calls for peace in the, in the public square. That's sort of at least my naive, maybe, association with the religious action for peace. But this is something quite different. This is negotiations that take place um, behind the scenes. And I think... Um, Without, without giving uh, Rabbi Roth's presentation for him, I think is predicated on the assumption that in order for there to be political peace in these conflicts that are so often agitated by religious actors, religion has to be on board. Religion has to be a part of that conversation. Maybe it's essential to that conversation. Um, so Rabbi Roth is really doing some of that really tense and, uh, and, and, and ex- exciting in, in many ways work um, that we don't get often to see. So this is really a chance to, to, to peek behind the curtain here. Um, Rabbi Roth has um, academic training in, in exactly this area. He has a PhD in, in conflict resolution. Um, and, and Rabbi Roth it kind of inherited this mantle from an, uh, another uh, great uh, peacemaker in the, in, the, in the religious world, Rabbi M- M- Michael Melchior, who was the chief rabbi of Norway, and, and was doing this work and was really recognized as a singular figure in this work. And then really, really kind of hand-selected Rabbi Roth was doing that work with him and re- as, as, really hand-selected Rabbi Roth to be the, the inheritor uh, of, of Mosaic and of this work. Um, so that's, that's uh, Rabbi Roth's uh, political work and his academic training, um, but he's really also a triple threat because Rabbi Roth also is just a good old-fashioned Torah teacher who spent a decade teaching Talmud at Pardes. And 
one of the reasons that we wanted Rabbi Roth in particular to lead us through this work is because he can share some of the, some of his, the wisdom of his experience and his work in the field, um, but also because uh, this is just the first in a series, um, the next three of which will be uh, an opportunity, opportunities to, to sit and learn about the, the, the whole concept of negotiation and conflict resolution as it emerges from our tradition. What do, what, what do our sources, what do our tradition, what does our tradition have to say about this? So I'm excited to introduce Rabbi Roth today to kind of open our eyes to the, the na this nature and the scope of this work. And I'm also ex excited after this um, to, to engage in a series of um, of Zoom sessions of online learning with Rabbi Ross, because after all, he lives in the land of, of Israel and, uh, and has flown here to kick off this series for us. The last thing I want to say, and I did say it was in my own backyard, is that, you know, he's also like, Rabbi Roth is also family to us because he's also Hannah Roth's brother. And, uh, and so, so we have, we kind of love him already, um, on a, on a personal level, but we're really excited to have his expertise and his wisdom and his learning here with us today. So without further ado, Rabbi Daniel Roth. Thank you, David. Um, good morning. It's very exciting to be here in a uh, in-person hybrid event. Um, as as uh, Rabbi Kasher mentioned, this is your first uh, in-person event. This is my first. Oh. Smile. Um, so I'm excited to be here, and I'm going to be sharing about 20, 25 minutes. Okay, of going a deep dive into what we're doing really in the last six to nine months. So we're going to start with like what's happening right now, like literally ending with what just happened last night and what's about to happen today. That's where we're going to start this session. And the next three sessions, we'll continue to update about what's going on uh, over the next few months, but also do uh, a deeper learning um, as, I'll, as I'll explain. So I'm going to be using this is actually my third time launching a new uh, program of mine, always at ICAR. <laughs> when I started the center, the Pardes Center for Judaism and Conflict Resolution, uh, about 10 years ago. As David mentioned, I taught at Pardes for 20 years. Uh, the opening event was at ICAR. When I started the, uh, the 9th of Adar, uh, Jewish Day of Constructive Conflict, which is now known as the Israeli Week of Mediation, it was at Ikar. And now, first time doing my uh, book launch, my book, which uh, we'll be talking about, and talking in person about the Religious Peace Initiative uh, in America as a first at Ikar. So, really excited to be here with you. So I'm just going to share, um, there's so many stops uh, in my personal journey that brought me to, to doing the work that I'm involved in. I think the one that always stands out most for me was uh, 1993, my first couple weeks studying in, in yeshiva uh, after, after high school, and really being exposed on the one hand to this very rich Talmudic culture of Chavruta study, of learning with a study partner, of engaging in disagreement, of being... And that's my story, and that's, uh... so, <laughs> um, so it was, it was, for me, the, uh, a starting point in my own journey was, on the one hand, studying Talmud, being pushed to constantly understand contradictory truth, how to explain opposite opinions, both being correct at the same time. But it was, it was also the signing of the Oslo Accords, um, literally two, three weeks after I started my studies, and seeing mass demonstrations happening uh, all over Israel, uh, for and against, not a lot of what we would call civic uh, discourse going on there. And yet in our Beit Midrash, in, uh, in Gush Etzion, over the Green Line, there was this amazing... Um, Agreement for the sake of heaven, where we had two rabbis with totally opposite political approaches stand up in front of all of our, our, the students, 700 young people, and argue in favor and against. 
uh, Rabbi Amital, blessed memory, argued from a political, halachic, Jewish legal, and theological position, why to support the peace process. And then Rabbi Yaakov Midan, uh, who was his student, who later inherited his position as head of the institution, one of the heads of the institution, argued the exact opposite, why this was a terrible danger, both politically and theologically, how it was against the process of redemption. And from a halachic perspective, it was forbidden to engage in this peace process and did a hunger strike uh, for over a month downtown Jerusalem. And, and he then argued the same way that we were taught of how the rabbis of the Talmud argued, was an incredible experience of connecting text study and Jewish tradition, ancient debate with the texts and the, and the real disagreements that are happening uh, today. Um, the last session here, I'm going to be jumping, the last session that we'll be doing together, should we over Zoom, okay? Uh, we're going to go deeper into this concept of what's called the memtet memtet, the 49-49, of how to understand contradictory truth, conflicting narratives. It's a tool that I use a lot, uh, as I'm going to explain, with the work that I do in practice. And because our goal here, by the end of the process of learning together, will also be how can you all um, engage in what I'm going to call insider mediators within your own context, in particular in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So um, that will be through a program that I developed at Pardes called Machlok It Matters, How to Disagree Constructively, of how literally the study of conflicting biblical narratives can actually be a preparation of the brain to be prepared to deal with conflicting narratives happening around political ideological issues, in particular the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're going to end with that, okay? Um, as I mentioned, uh, my book is really a summary of um, it's called Third Party Peacemakers in Judaism, Text Theory and Practice. That will be the focus uh, in the next session. Um, and that is also a summary of uh, I'm going to talk about it at the very end today, but of very um, rich, I would say, in-depth uh, textual research, historical research about the history of Jewish peacemaking, uh, in particular the third party, the mediator, okay? Connecting it to the practice and the, and the uh, what are the implications for practice today, and how does that compare to other theories of conflict resolution? Um, and that also escorts my journey that I had through Pardes in training rabbis, in training educators, in working with, uh, with um, a lot of different educational contexts, but also a lot of my work at Mosaica in terms of engaging in the practice of mediation. Um, after I left Pardes, as I said, I uh, stepped over into Mosaica, which you're going to learn more about, um, which is the Religious Peace Initiative. And then another little booklet, that is also part of this, uh, part of our educational series, which is literally called Inside the Religious Mediators uh, in the Context of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. So I'm asking people to get both of those, both of those books. So we have a four-part series, okay? Um, so today, we're really going to focus in on, as I said, what's going on. What does that mean, Inside a Religious Mediation, um, in the Context of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict? We're going to look at a few different examples that is, are safe enough to share, hopefully. <laughs> um, then we're going to go into the book next session and then do a, uh, a more in-depth study about who are these insider religious mediators that you're going to hear a little bit about today. You'll learn more about them in that second little booklet. And as I said, the fourth session, we're going to have an experience of how do we now try to do this in our own context. Okay? So... Um, Insider mediation. I don't think it's a term broadly known. I'm trying to get it into uh, more well-known uh, terminology, and I would like to use the language insider religious mediation. Um, but it basically means, summing up in my own words, it's who are the people who have influence over the groups in conflict? The militias, the people that are shooting, the quote-unquote bad guys or spoilers, who are the people that actually have direct influence on them? can we flip them into being part of the mediators? Because if the heads of those different groups that are actually in conflict are part of the ones mediating, 
then you can get a lot further in terms, or at least have a deep connection to those that are um, the quote unquote band guys. And you see that from what happened in Northern Ireland, okay, that there were uh, clergy members who were working with the militias, doing pretty gutsy things and being in contact with terrorist organizations, but they were engaged deeply with their own group and then secretly also connecting with each other, and that was part of their ability to affect change. Okay, it's true in different places of ethno-national conflicts, okay, where you can't just talk to the head of state because they're not the ones who necessarily have control over the real spoilers in the conflict. So who are the people that are in touch with those people? How do they, how can they be engaged? We have a parallel program in Europe called Amana, uh, that started in Melmo, where it's the highest level of anti-Semitism and uh, Islamophobia. How can a, the Rav and the Sheikh, heads of their community, work together as inside religious mediators is what we're doing also in Europe. So let's talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll share uh, very briefly about Mosaic. Um, uh, Mosaic was founded about 20 years ago by Rabbi Michal Malkior, then member of uh, Knesset, and uh, deputy minister, and uh, Elie Wiesel, a blessed memory. Um, and it really is about promoting mediation, conflict resolution, consensus building, from everything from building disputes, divorce mediation, okay, community mediation, all the way up to the mediation we're going to be talking about today, which is in the context of the uh, Religious Peace Initiative. Uh, as I'm going to do this. Um, we support one of our major programs is called the Gishirim Project. Um, where we support nearly 60 community mediation centers throughout Israel. Um, so it's volunteer, voluntary, uh, volunteer community mediators, about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 um, working with these centers, doing all different types of conflict resolution from schools to working with the community to working with, um, as I said, building disputes including 10 new centers that we're supporting in the Arab sector that are working directly with violence in the Arab sector. And the, what does that mean to create a community mediation center in a Bedouin city where there is a tremendous amount of, um, of clan violence and, and, uh, and organized crime? Um, also in the mixed cities, okay? We're gonna talk about what happened in the mixed cities in May. Uh, but we, have, we support mediation centers that are in the mixed cities. What role can they be playing? Um, in, in, in mitigating crisis situations. When I came into Mosaica, I came from the, the interest of integrating religion in conflict resolution, which is my background. So we opened up a couple new programs. One was what I call Rabbis as Mediators, okay, which is let's go and connect the most hard line, what we call Hardal, religious, right wing religious Zionist rabbis, to the world of mediation, conflict resolution have them be trained as mediators, connect them to the mediation centers in their local in their local area, so they can deal with conflicts within their community. In parallel, working with, uh, with sheikhs, with Arab Islamic uh, community leaders, um, often within the context of the Islamic movement, which we're gonna talk about, connecting them to the world of mediation and to their, uh, and their community mediation centers in their, in their city. And then very, 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 very delicately um, doing what we call insider religious mediation, which is the rabbi, who is the head of the Rabbis as Mediators program, who comes from the world of the right-wing religious Zionist kind of context, with his partner, the sheikh, who comes from the world of the Islamic movement, which we're going to talk about. The three of us work very delicately, and particularly in the mixed cities, as I'll explain in a bit, the mixed Arab Jewish cities, and how do you, everybody have their connections with the people that are literally in conflict as insider mediators to be able to diffuse situations and be able to promote religious peace? The idea was started by, um, I mentioned Rabbi Malkior, okay, who was involved in every type of political peace process from the very beginning and came to the conclusion um, really in the beginning of the second intifada that these secular political, liberal processes are not knowing how to engage the conservative, right-wing, um, religious groups in the conflict 
they're ignoring them, and that's not exactly going to work out long term. And he set on a journey with his partner, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Nimr Darwish. How many of you have heard of Sheikh Abdullah Nimr Darwish? Okay, so one day when I finish, when we finish writing the book about him and have the mo major uh, motion picture about him, everyone will know about him. Um, Sheikh Abdullah, you're going to learn a lot more about who Sheikh Abdullah was. I'll just say a sentence. Sheikh Abdullah was the founder of the Islamic movement. Okay, um, he uh, he was the founder of the first uh, Islamic jihad uh, terrorist uh, movement uh, back in the in the 70s. He was arrested, spent several years in Israeli jail, and during that time he went into the depths of Islamic study. And when he came out, he went through a transformation, and he told all of his adherents that we're now going to be an Islamic movement, part of the larger Muslim Brotherhood world, so they're like literally first cousins with Hamas, but we are promoting a nonviolent Islam. And we're going to stay within the rules, the laws of Israel. And they ran for municipal elections in the, in the 80s. They won a tremendous amount of, uh, of support. And in the mid 90s, they ran for the Knesset. Um, a little party that no one ever heard of called Ram. Anyone ever hear of Ram? Okay. Mansour Abbas. Anyone ever hear of Mansour Abbas? So no one ever heard of any of these people up until a few months ago. Um, but Sheikh Abdullah is the one who got this started. Um, in, in the mid, uh, in the, at, the, at the end of the second intifada in 2005, he started the religious peace initiative with Rabbi Malkir, saying, let me bring my connections and your connections, and let's figure out a way to connect the people that are literally shooting at each other. Because if we could connect them, the Americans, the Europeans, no one will be able to do this as, as much as the insiders who are really deeply connected to the people in conflict. Sheikh Abdullah passed away in 2017, um, and his his heir, his successor, uh, is a man named Sheikh Raid Badir, who you'll learn a lot about, who's the top Islamic, we'll call him POSIC, or, or codifier of Islamic law of the Islamic movement, in particular the southern branch of the Islamic movement. I'm sharing with you a lot of terminology. You can write down questions. We're going to have a lot of time for questions. But right now, you'll, I want to share... Um, five examples of what does insider mediation look like just from over the last few months. Then I'm going to pause, and Rabbi Sharon and I are going to have a, a conversation on it. We'll open it up, okay? First example of what do I mean by insider mediation is that we work directly with the WHO, with the World Health Organization in Europe. We were the first uh, NGO in Europe to be picked to work directly with them. They normally work with ministries of health. Why? Because they realized that in order to be able to get to certain groups, in particular religious groups, they're not always listening to the, uh, the official government agencies. Okay? Uh, we helped them solve some conspiracy theories way back, uh, in, in, in September 2020. And they're like, we need to be partnering with religious leaders, with an organization that can gather religious leaders to constantly put out conspiracy theories. And they saw that as insider mediation. Who is the one who is connected that can help write the religious ruling that will save lives? And the same way we're doing that about COVID constantly, that's also the way we're working to save lives. Um, in, in the Second example, there was an Israeli election. Okay. There were many Israeli elections. This election was not like the other elections, okay, for numerous reasons. One of the reasons is because of Mansour Abbas, okay? Um, here you see a picture from, this was, I took from Mansour's uh, Facebook page of how close he was with Sheikh Abdullah, who you ju I just mentioned. He really sees himself as a continuation of the process that Sheikh Abdullah had started, okay, that is deeply rooted in Islamic tradition, part of the larger world of political Islam, it's not Sufi Islam, it's part of the, you know, Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood in one way or the other, how we define that, we can go into greater detail. But the way Sheikh Abdullah had taught to engage in pragmatism from an Islamic, from a deeply Islamic place, being pragmatic, um, to save lives as the highest value in Islam, and to improve the lives of Muslims, 
and to engage in the religious peace initiative. Um, I was just reading, there was an article in the New Yorker uh, just the other day, very long article in the New Yorker about Mansour Abbas. There's one line of saying, and he met with leaders of the Hamas, and how is that possible? They said, it's okay, he did it with Rabbi Malkior as part of the religious peace initiative. And then everyone's like, oh, well, that's okay. I'm like, how is that okay? <laughs> no one ever asked. Like, oh, that's totally normal. But as long as he's meeting with a rabbi with members of Hamas, that's fine. But he's gone on the record numerous times saying, I'm part of the religious peace initiative. This is part of how I work. I want to be a mediator between Israel and the Middle East. Okay? Um, as the, the election was uh, in March, the day after, we already were getting questions from all the different coalition partners saying, who is this? Can we trust him? Who is the, what's the Islamic movement? What's the southern branch? What's the northern branch? Who, what's going on here? Um, I had opened up an academic wing of Mosaica to actually research who's who um, of all these different Islamic leaders, both within Israel and throughout the Middle East, uh, and doing a mapping of who's influential over whom. Um, and we literally gave briefings that went to those doing the different mediations between the different coalition partners, fairly working with both parties. There were, both, there were two different options of where the coalition ended. Okay, put my political, personal views aside. And, um, and it really came down to a very, very strong debate between academics of is Mansour Abbas and the southern branch of the Islamic movement, the, the path forward for Israel to really integrate into the Middle East and to have uh, a sustainable peace agreement with the Palestinians? Is this a channel that now has opened up? Or is this the greatest threat to Israel's existence because this is a Trojan horse? Okay, I will share, if we have time, the debates I was literally engaged in last night and very early this morning that are happening as they're about to sign the budget, which is a very critical moment. Will this coalition last, or will we be in another election in, in, in a few months? It will depend on what's about to happen this week. And the, and, and it's the question of will that coalition work partly has to do with how who is Mansour Abbas, and what is the Islamic movement, and what is the Ram Party? Um, I didn't go on to any, uh, I didn't write any articles in the newspapers, I didn't go on to any TV shows, because everyone will be like, he's already, that's not objective. <laughs> so instead, I had my, uh, uh, my colleagues from Bar-Ilan, who, who I took in particular, uh, a great scholar who said, Daniel, I don't believe in any of this. I am totally right-wing. I'm an academic, but I think that the Muslim Islamic world can never accept the state of Israel, and this all sounds kind of naive. I said, you're a perfect person to research what I'm doing. I said, because if you're convinced, you'll be infinitely more convincing than myself or Rabbi Malkyar. So I send her out <laughs> to the front lines, to all the TV shows, and all the, uh, her briefings were the ones that were brought to Bennett. Um, and to others, as soon as they said, oh, professor from bar Ilan, okay, because she has a debate with her teacher, Moti Kedar, who is determined to, say, to prove to the world that Mansour Abbas is a Trojan horse of Hamas, and that this is an existential threat to the state of Israel. So that is another key part of um, holding Mansour Abbas safe, uh, both from within the Muslim world, that he's not considered a traitor, and kosher at the same time for Israel is a very, very delicate, uh, very, very delicate piece here. Um, and it's really part of the narrative of the Islamic movement, which is on the one hand stuck between a rock and a hard place, that their, their roots are with Hamas and with the Muslim Brotherhood, and they're deeply connected. On the other hand, they're loyal citizens of the state of Israel, and they're very integrated and normalized, as we say, Right with what's going on, and Mansour had been meeting with religious Zionist rabbis for years, okay, and had been part. So they're on the one hand they could be seen as traitors from both sides. On the other hand, that's why they're the perfect insider mediator, because they're connected to the people. Um, Jerusalem, you may remember, that in May the events really got started around Jerusalem, okay. That includes Sheikh Jarrah, but it also includes events that were happening around. Al-Aqsa and the Temple Mount. Um, because Sheikh Jarrah is seen as the neighborhood just outside of Al-Aqsa. 
Similar stories are happening all over the country. But that story in particular was very, very poignant for the Muslim world because it was so close. Well, Zanka had been involved for years in mediating conflicts around the Temple Mount. One that went into the news was in 2017, if you remember, that there was the, um, um, the, the terrorist attack where two Israeli, where two Israeli policemen were, were killed on the Temple Mount, and then they tried to put up these uh, metal detectors. When you come in, that almost created a third intifada. We're not going to go into depth. We'll learn more about that in our third session. Um, but because we had a relationship for years training Israeli police, as I said, we do a lot of just straight up conflict resolution. We trained about 100 police stations uh, and worked with the heads of the Israeli police in cultural sensitivity work. And because we had a relationship with the Waqf, the Islamic religious um, um, council that oversees the Al Aqsa Mosque, uh, Mosaic was able to literally kind of mediate that and delicately avoid a. Uh, when it came to what happened, the events in May, okay, the morning of, I'm on the WhatsApp groups of the Jews who go up to the Temple Mount, thanks to family members. <laughs> and um, at the same time, I get the WhatsApps from the Waqf, from the, from the Islamic Council, and from the police. So I'm constantly seeing everything that's going on, the like train wreck ahead. And, then you, and I'm seeing two different narratives of what's happening here. You know, I'm seeing on the one hand, look, the, the Palestinians are getting ready. They're, 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 they have Molotov cocktails. They have stones. They're ready to get the Jews who are coming onto Jerusalem Day. And the other hand, I'm seeing like, you know, police brutality, storming the mosque, and all these things. And like, what's happening? The WhatsApp completely different narratives. Completely different narratives. Um, this picture, I think, like stands out most point. You know, most. Um, at the center of, of where the conflict was, who start literally who started the fire um, in on the Temple Mount Al Aqsa, which the Muslims were all convinced it was the police. The police, the Israelis are convinced this was you know um, somebody throwing a Muslim cocktail. It didn't really make a difference. It's a question of what do we do about this. Um, I also remind you that there was the issue of the uh, Nablus Gate that's still happening right now um, that went back a couple weeks before the actual break, uh, breakout of the war in May. Um, again, I can't show everything that we did, but I will say two things that did go public was that working with a walk council who spoke in Al-Aqsa against violence, um, we had that video um, translated into Hebrew, sent it out to religious leaders, sent it out to you saying, look, they are making an effort within Al-Aqsa. Not everybody, some are. And at the same time, Chief Rabbi of Israel who I, I think I literally gave him, I almost gave him a heart attack when I showed up right before the holiday of Shavuot. And I said, uh, Rav Lau, we need you to do a video right now. We have a potential holy war uh, that is about to break out. And we need to put that genie back in the bottle and send as many messages that we're going to WhatsApp to the top Islamic leaders in the world that are saying we have no interest in changing the status of the Temple Mount and we have no interest in a holy war. Uh, he still comments, he comes there like, you're that one who really scared me that day. So, um, I want to talk about mixed cities. I'm going to talk about mixed cities, Israeli Palestinian conflict, and we're going to, uh, and then we're going to pause. Um, mixed cities. I think people might have seen um, the many mixed Jewish Arab cities as like, okay, that's a domestic conflict. Gentrification, it's, it's all sorts of different things that are happening within Israeli society. It's part of shared society conversations. It's not part of the Israeli Palestinian conflict, right? Wrong. It's very much part of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. In the cities of Lod, Akko, Jaffa, um, Haifa, Ramle. As a matter of fact, we, we say about five or six mixed cities. In a few years, there will be about 20 mixed cities. Because the way demographics and where people are living, you have more and more cities that are 30, 40% Arab, okay, 60, 70% Jewish, living side by side, very different ideologies, and, um, and there's a lot of potential for tension there. But in particularly traditional mixed cities. So we had started uh, what I call kind of the, the, uh, the minor leagues to our major leagues of working in the Israeli Palestinian conflict. We're saying, who are the most influential religious leaders, community religious leaders? We're not talking about religious leaders that don't have strong influence over the community. Religious leaders as community leaders 
that are the most influential in each of these cities, if we can connect the two of them, then they can serve as insider mediators, and we can avoid lots of misunderstandings and build a lot more real shared society. So myself, the Rav, who I mentioned, the Rabbi, and, and the Sheikh, we started doing a mapping, who's who, who knows whom within each of these cities. We started connecting them. There was a moment, this is about a year and a half ago that we started this process. There was a moment of, uh, of total satisfaction and pride that May 6th, I had set up a date between the rabbi and the sheikh, first time without me there, okay, after doing a lot of matchmaking and chaperoning. They went on a date by themselves. The rabbi went over to the sheikh's house. It turns out they both play the clarinet, like who knew? How random. They like, played clarinet, went into the sheikh's car, they drove around the city, they went through what they call the refugee camp that Jews never go into, especially not the religious Zionist rabbi, the head of the Garin Torani of the, 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 the Arabs call it the settlement within these mixed cities. Um, and then they worked uh, very kind of behind the scenes in putting this document together of uh, explaining what's about to happen with the Moazin, the call to prayer at the end of Ramadan, which is often understood by Jews as a call to war. No, it's a call to prayer and everyone gets very nervous and it's all, so we're like, let's just take a practical thing, let's solve that, very small. And that was supposed to happen on Jerusalem Day. That was supposed to happen on May 10th. May 6th, they were in touch. They came to the exact wording together. No one was going to know that they had been working on it together. No one will ever see this except for on a PowerPoint that I'm showing with you right now. Because needless to say, it never was shared. Because this happened. Musa uh, Hassan was shot, killed by one of the people from the Garin. The Garin, again, being the religious Zionist community for a.k.a. the settlement within the mid city. Um, it w that case was actually just uh, closed a few days ago because they can't figure out who killed him, which from the Arab population, that is ridiculous. Um, and my friend the Sheikh was literally at the scene, and the Rav was at the scene, and on different sides of what just happened. So they each physically saw what happened in different ways. They cannot speak to each other anymore. The entire time during the war, till 2 in the morning, I'm in touch with them, just WhatsApping, trying to avoid misunderstanding where the different militias were going. There were numerous militias on the different sides. Um, so working with the mid-cities, again, there's just so many narratives. There was a lynch that happened against an Arab that no one knew about, but I'm like, that has to be brought in the Then there were lynches that happened by Arabs against Jews that no one knew about. So, like, talking about balancing narratives, this was... Again, a microcosm of the entire Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it's within like a four-block radius. Because you have the most right-wing religious Zionists who are supporters of the religious Zionist party, as it's called today, it's all so rich, even to even to Ben Gvir. And then you have, um, as we'll talk about the Islamic movement, and the northern branch of the Islamic movement, which is more associated with Hamas, all living in the same building. Okay? Um, Line is, if they can't coexist, there is no hope for a peace process. If they could be a model for how they can work together, that's a really important kind of test case. So it's not a disconnected part. I see it as part of the larger body of the conflict. And as we saw, when they said, why are you burning things down in Lod? They said, because of Al-Aqsa. Why are you, you know, it wasn't because of what happened in Lod. It was because of what happened in, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. I think everything is deeply connected to this deep religious component. And if we don't use religious tools and religious mediators, there will not be a way to figure out how to, um, how to move forward. So the question is, again, the printing is, I'm sorry, the letters are <laughs> small. The question is, how can these religious leaders be connected to first their mediation center? So that it's practical for their own uh, context, and then be connected to each other to be able to resolve real resolve conflict. In Ramle, okay, uh, there's a coalition of religious uh, of community leaders where they walk the streets together, okay. And it's a story that people are all like, "How do we take that model and apply it to other cities?" And the answer is, you can't. I can explain why later. Because Ramle is Ramle, Lod is Lod, Akko is Akko. Can't do it. It's impossible. 
Um, but Ramle, there was a model that worked. But the rabbi in Lod and the sheikh in Akko both sought out partners during the war and said, please connect me, let's walk the streets. Uh, our friend, the, the sheikh in Akko, literally went to a local yeshiva by himself, walked in and said, where is your rabbi? I want him to hold my hand and let's walk the streets and tell the kids to go home. He didn't succeed. Okay? Um, we also do a lot of police training. Okay? Two, a few months before the corona, uh, two years ago, almost exactly today, we did a training about exactly to, to the 300 top Israeli police officers in the country of exactly how to operate if you have a crisis in mixed cities. Who to talk to in terms of religious leaders, precedents of things that we had succeeded doing in 2008 when there was a, a flare-up in Akko and in 2014 when Yom Kippur and Eid al-Adha, two holiest days, coincided and there was a lot of concern of a break, uh, of outbreak of, uh, of, of violence and tension. And we presented a whole model of exactly how to do this. It didn't happen. Okay? Uh, but the police also play a really, really, really important role. Um, and so, just, just to conclude the mixed cities component, because it's a part that I'm very involved in, and I think it's a very important part that has been overlooked in the context of the conflict. Um, what I'm presenting here is a brief model uh, a proposal of what could be done, which is we have our mediation center. They're very successful in working with police, working with the community, working with the, their part of the municipality, so they work with the mayor. They're not successful in working with the Arab population, and they have not been enough successful in working with these Garinim, these religious Zionist communities. They're successful with everyone else, which is really nice, but not sufficient. So, therefore, what we're in the process of doing right now is taking our team that has been working with the Arab sector, saying how can we connect, um, how can we connect the religious Zionist community, the right wing religious Zionist community, from their perspective, they're in this mixed city to make it more Jewish. Often not with a mindset of coexistence and mixed, you know, uh, uh, let's, you know, be in a mixed city. Some are, some aren't. There's, a, there's, there's nuances amongst each community and each rabbi. How can we connect them to the mediation center? And in parallel, connect the Arab community within these mixed cities, which are often the most forgotten in the Arab population, because they don't have a mayor that's, over, that's, that's looking out for their interests. Um, so the most influential leadership of these communities that really were in battle in May is the religious leadership. The other is crime families. Okay, there's a tremendous amount of the youth getting involved in crime families. Okay, um, there's a whole reason to that. The only group within their community that's standing up against them are the religious leaders from the Islamic movement. So that's also part of the story of Mansur, of what his interest is in trying to get rid of violence and, and crime. So right now we are in the very delicate process of creating what we're calling satellite mediation centers that will just work with within the violence within the Arab sector, working with with women, uh, with the religious leadership, with youth, with everybody to strengthen their culture and resolve as a community to thwart these crime families. In addition to everything else the government's trying to pass with policing, isn't sufficient if you don't strengthen the community from within. So who to work with, who has the influence in order to be able to do that? And then in parallel, connecting the rabbi and the sheikh to be able to work in a very practical way. We do not do dialogue groups. We don't do any kind of having people sit around and take pictures together at all. Um, there are initiatives like that. They're not the ones who are generally influential over the quote-unquote bad guys. Let's talk about the B conflict, and then I'm going to pause. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is our, is our fifth example. Okay? When we think about who are the sides of the conflict, who are the decision makers, who needs to be engaged, people often think prime minister, or in our case, prime ministers, okay, I really want to define Bennett and Yair Lapid, and who's the other side? Abu Mazen. There's only one problem. Abu Mazen has 
very little influence today, certainly not in Gaza. Um, you have to include these guys, the heads of the Hamas, Sinwar and Hania. Well, who's engaging them? Americans can't engage them. Europeans can't engage them, as we'll see. So who's, who's, who's engaging them in any way? So you can't only forget, you can't only talk about the heads of the Hamas. You have to talk about, well, who is the leadership in Jerusalem? Because East Jerusalem and who has access to the Al-Aqsa Mosque is a critical part of the conflict. So they are their own kind of leadership. Uh, we'll talk about Akram Sabari and another name who I won't mention right now, who have significant influence, even though they don't have formal positions, significant influence over what's happening in East Jerusalem and need to be engaged. They can't be engaged because of the leadership. Um, we have to look also internationally in terms of who has influence over what's happening in this conflict. You have the Saudis, but the Saudi religious leadership, okay, um, um, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Isa. How many of you heard of Sheikh Muhammad Al Isa? I think you might have all heard of him. He was the Sheikh who took 70 Islamic leader, Muslim leaders to Auschwitz a couple years ago. Does that ring a bell? He's been a strong advocate for religious peace um, and been a very strong friend of our of our work of religious of the religious peace initiative. Can he play a role as a mediator? Well, that depends on a whole bunch of things that I'm not going to get into right now. Um, but the ones who are most influential are these two gentlemen over there in the, uh, on the bottom of the screen. That's Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi. Uh, anyone here of Yusuf al-Qardawi? The most important Islamic leader in the Muslim world the last 30, 40 years. Head of the Muslim Brotherhood. Nothing happens in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict without his agreement or uh, he was the one who gave the, uh, the fatwa of uh, allowing suicide bombings. He was the one who, uh, numerous things, okay? Um, he's the posek, the religious leader of Hamas. So who's engaging him? Is Hamas, are they really the leaders? They're political leadership. But who's their leadership? And who's engaging their leadership? If they say it is religiously forbidden to engage in negotiations with Israel, well, then you have to be talking to the person who's saying that it's forbidden religiously, that they are a religious movement. They're not just a political movement. They're a nationalist religious movement. And then the other hand of the conflict, you have the Shah, you have the Shabbat, okay, the Israeli secret police, which play a very important role in terms of how they're interpreting the conflict and what information they're sharing, who's engaging them. You have the Israeli police, which play a very important role both in terms of the mixed cities, the Arab sector, and East Jerusalem, when it comes to the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa, the police are in control. Then you also have the religious leadership. I mean, many people didn't even know about who they are in Israel until it came down to, are they saying Mansur Abbas is kosher, not kosher? Okay, so you have these, I've brought two, two of the faces, who are the religious leaders behind the religious Zionist party. Okay? The politicians have a certain degree of influence, but the religious leadership behind them has even more influence. So who's engaging those religious leaders? And what are they saying? Okay, we'll talk about this not now, but in session three, the man in the middle, Rabbi Yaakov Ariel, what's the significance of him coming with us to meeting with the heads of Hamas in 2016 in Spain and coming up with a religious declaration of peace? It was very, very simple. In terms of the mediators, who's mediating between these different parts of the conflict? So you have the U.S., which I intentionally put a little bit closer to Israel, the EU, the UN, um, the Egyptian mediators, and the Qatari mediators. We don't have time to go into all this, but the Egyptian and Qatari mediators actually have an interest of the conflict continuing on and on and on because their relevance to the U.S. is that they're the mediator. So if there's no conflict, they're no longer the mediator. So who's actually engaging the religious leadership? I'm not saying we're the only actors. I'm telling you in terms of our work plan. Um, so within our work, we have, um, as I said, Sheikh Abdullah and Rabbi Malkir, who set off on this journey. So how are we going to connect all these different people with each other? So today, Sheikh Raid Badir, who I mentioned, um, who's now the top uh, leader of the religious leader of the Islamic movement. Mansour Abbas is the top political leader of, uh, of the party of Ram. And what is that channel? 
how can that play a role in affecting change, not only within Israel, but in terms of the conflict? Conversations, trust between Mansour, between Bennett, okay? Can that be a channel with Mansour and his connections to be able to actually connect all these different dots? Um, so, what we'll be doing in uh, in the third session in this little booklet is having a little bit of an understanding about who are these different mediators. Um, two of them are unfortunately no longer alive, but others are very active right now. Uh, some of them are more in the space of meeting Jim Fatah and Hamas, and then connecting that to Israel. Some of them are more in the context of, within Israel, connecting you know, um, religious Zionist rabbis with, with Islam. Um, we also support centers in Gaza and Ramallah. Um, one of the people that was there is one of the founders of Hamas, um, and he's one of the mediators, and Sheikh Imad, who you'll learn about, um, which do things as a center in terms of trauma therapy, working with women in Gaza, students, training them in dialogue, training them in not only about these Israeli Palestinian conflicts, it's just mediation, dialogue within their community, but then allowing him to also uh, mediate between both Fatah and Hamas. And um, and within the context, unfortunately, our, the office was bombed. Uh, we are now scrambling to try to uh, to restore that. Um, Thank you. That was absolutely incredible. I want to share that um, over, over the years, as you mentioned, you've been to Icar, and we've spoken a number of times. We spoke in May when things were um, were really really difficult, um, and and I um, it became clear to me at that time that if the coalition government was going to happen, it would be in large part because of actors like you, who we did not see in the press, who were really back-channeling and working to make this a reality in ways that we would never understand. And so I'm just so grateful that this group here gets to have a little glimpse into some of what was going on behind the scenes. And we can publicly thank you for your incredible efforts. Um, when you talk about being on WhatsApp groups at 2 in the morning, um, I know that, that we're just, and there's so much that you're not allowed to share with us of what you're doing, and I have a, a sense that this work is um, not only exhausting, but also dangerous, and um, I, I, I'm so grateful, um, really, on behalf of our community and the broader Jewish community, if I may, um, to know that you are a voice of, of sanity, of compassion, of reason, um, really, really stepping forward and, and, and stepping into the, difficult, the most difficult spaces in order to try to advance a conversation toward peace. So, so thank you for that. I want to start by saying thank you. There's more. Um, there's more because Rabbi Roth not only helped build the coalition government or made it so that people wouldn't flee the coalition government before it even existed, but also, as you hinted at, averted a holy war. And these are the things that we only would hear about after the worst thing unfolds and say, why wasn't anyone there trying to avert this? And it's really difficult to prove a counterpositive. But to know that you were in those places talking to Rabbi Lau and others and saying, this is what I'm hearing that they need to hear from us and we can do this now to avert disaster is really incredibly significant. And I'm, and I'm profoundly grateful to you and I think we all are. So... Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So what we're going to do is I, I have a few questions that I'm dying to ask you, um, some of which I've asked you many times over the years, and I want to ask you again because I'm still trying to sort them out in my own work and in my own head. And what we would love to engage in conversation, and in this room are some of the peacemakers in our own community, um, people who've really dedicated many years of their own lives to trying to bring together parties that don't often listen to each other. Um, and I think we can have a very fruitful conversation. Um, we have about half an hour together um, more. So thank you for your generous um, opening for us, and, and I look forward to being in this conversation. Um, so what, one thing I, I want to say just at the outset is, I'm, because you're here at ICAR and you said that you've launched a bunch of these initiatives by coming to visit Hannah and, um, and, and sharing with us some of these ideas uh, in their earliest stages, um, I shared with Rabbi Roth that I was reading the preface of the book this morning, actually, um, which I hadn't, I hadn't read before, and there's so much that's parallel between your, uh, the early stages of what set you on this journey and what set me on my own journey, which ultimately ended up um, taking us in, in sort of, I would say, very different 
manifestations of a similar directional path. And, um, and so even so far as, you know, both of us in graduate school, um, within a couple years of each other asking the same question about how can it be that the 14 or 15 hours a day that I'm spending learning Talmud every day in the Beit Midrash or in, uh, or in, um, the university cannot be directly connected to and directly impactful in, in the, the crises that are going on around us. And both of us asking that same question, you in Jerusalem and me in New York, led both of us to the same book written by Mark Gopin called Between Eden and Armageddon, which became a formative work for both of us in trying to think about this work. And it led me to, um, to, to study um, human rights and conflict resolution at Columbia while I was finishing rabbinical school and obviously led you on this incredible journey. So I feel really deeply, um, deeply moved by your journey. And, and, um, and I had a realization that many of the same tools that that, compli- that that are used in conflict resolution are also the same tools that we use in marriage counseling. And what, you know, when individuals come and sit before us and ask for help sort of working through um, what seem to be intractable conflicts are the same principles that we would use um, when we're trying to deal with post-conflict regions or even um, current conflict regions. And so I'm very struck by, uh, by that notion that the principles, which you're going to be going into in the next three sessions with us, um, are actually that these that these principles are, are ones that can be applied not only for us as potential we're not most of us will not be in the role that you're in where we're going to be standing between Ram and you know between Smotrich and and, um, and, and and Mansour Abbas trying to get them to see each other's humanity but each of us and all of us will stand in those roles with others and so I wonder if you can if we can just start by you cheating for us, uh, um, maybe just some of the basic tools that you think that, um, that, that you will help us learn as uh, at helping us become the mediators that, um, that we can be, some of the most basic tools that you hope that we will achieve over the course of this learning, which for you have been at the very heart of religious third-party peacemaking. So, yeah, thank you. And, I, and I, it's so interesting uh, we both started with that book. That was really one of the foundational books, I think, of religious peace building in general. Um, just kind of study that. So I'll, I'll, I'll share just um, uh, one idea that we're going to come back to again about in that fourth session in particular, which is that you mentioned, you know, Talmud study, and I mentioned Talmud study and religious studies, and I think that religious studies really play two important roles in this work. Uh, one is it's a it's a motivator, it's an inspiration. People get involved in this work and get very burnt out, uh, very discouraged. And I think when you see it as a sense of like a mitzvah, as like this religious charge, um, my book goes into like story after story after story of people that just didn't give up. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. And I'm like, if he could do that, if she could do that, who am I? The one I think is religious. Um, text, I think, is like a motivation that answers the why. Um, and the other is, I think it answers also how. Um, because I think that so much of these conflicts are narrative-based. Um, you know, when we think about, like, what are the skills people need to engage as a therapist? So people will learn psychology. People are going to learn law if they're involved, involved in mediation. People are going to learn political science if they've been involved in the peace process or other things. But what about, like, text study? And text study, in my mind, is actually at the core of a conflict. Not only because there's religious texts that are being disagreed upon, it's also because just the story. I mean, literally, we'll do this as a, as a tool, but when we had, um, back in, in the beginning of May, before the war, there was, a, there was an incident that happened in the city of Yaffa, where there was a rabbi that was attacked by two uh, Arab men. And then later that afternoon, there was a sheikh that was attacked by, uh, by, by Jews. And literally, we did a map of like, we did text study of like, what's the text? What is, what is everyone saying? How, what are the different interpretations of what's happening in each of these different incidents? And I think that that is part of what I was saying is conditioning the brain in being able to understand what's my text? What's my story? What, as I say, my 49 that's bringing me into this context as a mediator or as a side in the conflict? And how is everybody interpreting these stories in a slightly different way? And how can I bring people to understand different interpretations? 
and to move away from fact to interpretation. the most difficult question, and I'm, and I'm sure many people were thinking this as, as we were listening to your presentation this morning. Um, you know, for progressives, the idea of listening to perspectives that make us uncomfortable is kind of, you know, that's breakfast. And so that's easy for us. Um, we know that being uncomfortable is just part of being decent and, um, and trying to find each other's humanity and um, making space for a whole host of positions that aren't the same as yours, but but recognizing and honoring that different people come from different narratives, et cetera. But can we talk about where the limits might be that you found to um, to kind of acceptable engagement in the discourse? Because, you know, we say elu but elu, and then part of your Ninth of Adar work is, I think, showing us, like, it's a little bit of a fantasy that we should be able to make a tent that's big enough to hold everybody's voices. And our tradition says, make your ear and that's our keset, and you know, big enough to take in all different kinds of perspectives. Some of the people that you're talking to and working with have have murdered Jews, right? Or have 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 supported ideologically the the murder of Jews. Some of the people that you're talking to um, have written halachic treatises justifying the murder of Palestinian babies because one day they'll grow into terrorists. I don't know if you're meeting with those exact rabbis, but you're meeting with their friends, right? So, how, what are the boundaries of our kind of open-hearted engagement with people whose ideas we might find morally repugnant. And is there, is there anyone you won't talk to? Because it's too, it's too violent. It's too dangerous. Their views, they don't deserve a seat at your table. It's so easy to say, I don't want to talk to all these Whoever, you know, might be defined as the bad guy. Um, but I think that the ones who have influence, you know, who, who, who are literally affecting everyone's lives right now, um, someone has to engage in it. Like when I look back at what happened in Northern Ireland, and I see like these brave, urgent leaders who would sit and meet with these arch terrorists in jail, and sit there having these conversations. Um, and they were morally appalled by who they're meeting with. But at the same time, they knew that this was holy work and engaging them uh, because of the influence that they were going to have on the larger conflict. So, you know, there's a very fine line between giving them a certain type of legitimacy and at the same time needing to engage those that are actually shooting. I think what we saw in May in particular is that a lot of these I would say dialogue groups, coexistence groups, um, collapsed because they their circles were ultimately um, in a bubble, and they didn't have tentacles that are hitting to the ones who are most radical. So it's not that you're going to be able to bring everyone into a circle and say you're all legitimate, and you're all the same, and you're all you know kosher. But someone's got to be talking to somebody who's the one who's shooting. Um, and, and I think what's inspiring is that when that when the right person shows up to have that conversation and has the right amount of preparation on how to have that conversation, there can be transformative moments. I wasn't in a meeting, but a meeting that I was told about with um, uh, that Rabbi Malka and Sheikh Zayed went to a few years ago with one of the greatest anti-Semites of our time. An Islamic leader, top three or four Islamic leaders in the world, religious leaders, who wrote an encyclopedia um, that explains about Zionism and about Jews and, and anti-Semitism. And everyone's like, how can you meet with him? And they sat down and had an argument and a discussion. It's like, no one ever told me some of these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, will he change and do tshuva? I don't know, but somebody needs to be engaging that person who has a significant amount of influence. Um, so anybody that I can get to meet uh, that has influence, Thank God ISIS doesn't have that much influence on our conflict. I'm not going to meet with them. No worries, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> but those that do need to be engaged. And if, and if we're really honest, the goal of that engagement is that we're hoping to change their views so that they see the world a little bit more like we do, right? Like, we're hoping that they think, 
maybe I shouldn't murder Jews, right? Maybe that's not the best tactic to try to bring about a, a, a different, to try to bring about a, a solution to this conflict. See, that's the beauty of the religious conversation, is that, you know, when these religious leaders are engaged, and they're, you know, they've often been out of the conversation of the peace process on both sides. And they're in different ways and different... And they see peace as a very secular, liberal pursuit um, that's actually kind of almost an anti-religious pursuit by many. Um, that's how they perceive it. But when they start to be engaged about how there is a holy war within the Islamic tradition, where there's, all these, there's also something called a holy peace, what conditions does that exist under? How do you get there? That It's not that you only have one option within your religious tradition. You have more than one option. How is that engaged? And it's not me who's engaging him. It's another top Islamic leader who's writing and having that conversation, and then they're bringing a rabbi along with that conversation. And that dynamic, and that you go back to, again, you mentioned this about Apathy, another founder, the ambivalence of the sacred, of how religious, deep religious traditions can be interpreted in different ways. That's part of avoiding this clash, you know, of the civilizations and the clash of only intractable conflict, but religion is only this way. But religion has the keys to also be a deep, a deep bridge, but you have to make sure you're engaging the ones who really have the keys of interpretation and the influence over the narratives. Okay, and this leads me to, to my next question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'll ask two more questions and then we'll open it up so folks have ideas about what you want to say. Who holds the keys to religious interpretation? Almost, at least as far as I can tell, almost every person who appeared on that wall was male. Um, and, and so I wonder if necessarily it, placing the, um, the, pl placing the emphasis on these religious traditions as they've been traditionally, um, engaged necessarily creates a space that, that women and non-binary and trans people will not have a voice in. Um, and I, it, it made me wonder what's the equivalent of this project where, and, and yet, I think that there's a tremendous amount of power that um, each of these people's, perhaps their partners, might hold if they were to be in conversation with each other. And so, how do you deal with the fact that these, that both of our religious traditions, Jewish and, and, and Muslim religious traditions, traditionally and historically have um, given primacy to male interpreters? Um, and and how, can we actually envision a peace that naturally and probably necessarily um, it, at least erases um, at least half of the population from the possibility of being one of the key voices? So it's a great question. Um, I'm not saying that these are the only religious interpretations. That is certainly not where I'm at personally. But the ones who have the religious keys over the, the groups that are deeply in conflict are right now uh, like the, the heads of the Muslim Brotherhood and the heads of Hamas are all men. Um, the heads, of the key leaders of the Hardal or the religious Zionist right wing are also all men. So it makes it very tricky for women to play a role as either the mediator or the interpreter. Um, there are a couple of women that played that in that a little bit in that space. It's very, 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 very hard. On the other hand, I will say that, um, I'll say two things. One is that um, in that meeting between the rabbi and the sheikh, when they become friends and they literally start understanding, it's fascinating to hear them have conversations, not in like a organized, facilitated dialogue group, but like in the kitchen, having a conversation about um, the role of women I had a, 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 a very, very influential rabbi um, from the West Bank sitting with a very, very influential sheikh. And I just said, stop talking about the conflict. Just, we're sitting and walking around the street. I said, just talk about whatever. Talk about the last fatwa you wrote. Last religious ruling. So the sheikh said, I just wrote a religious ruling that women can fly on their own. They don't need a chaperone. The rabbi's like, did I need to write something like that? I didn't know I need to write something about it. The rabbi said, well, what do you think about like same-sex marriage? And the sheikh is like, we don't have that with us. And the rabbi's like, yes, you do. <laughs> like, you might want to think about it a little bit. More. But there was like this, and we had, we had a situation with the, um, what was it, with the, with the uh, police, I think that we had, 
it was something a few, right before May, where there was a whole thing about, um, again, about LGBT rights that came up. And it was interesting, the sheikh called the Rav and asked him, like, what do you guys think about that? And the Rav was a little bit more pretty conservative, but more open about it. The sheikh, and I'll say that over the years, not directly addressing it, not saying, here we are, we have an agenda, we want you to come and be more progressive. But through this kind of meeting of minds, there's been kind of a changing, that there is a fatwa uh, that this religious leader made that there could be a kadit, a woman judge, which, by the way, there still is no women judge on the of the Rabbanut in, in Israel, so they've passed us in that regard, and that a third of their political list of Ram has to now be women, which is also not typical uh, in, in, in the Islamic movement. So there are these little changes, but it's certainly not. In terms of LGBT, that's another conversation where, uh, in this context, I will share that I was once having a conversation with a rabbi and a sheikh who kept on saying, oh, we're really similar. No, we're, we're very different on everything, but we really both agree that LGBT rights are a problem. And, I, and they were all talking, and I said, and I just let them have it for 45 minutes. I said, I said you know, I'm a proud brother of my, of my sister, and I wrote a ceremony, and they were like, you? I said, yes, and this is a real, I said, Allah doesn't want you, your, you know, your 16-year-old to be in the closet, and God forbid to hurt them. And like just pushing that, but then nobody never engaged them in that conversation. But it came from deep trust and, and real relationships that those conversations can be had in, in, in private. It actually reminds me of an incredible story of yours, um, Hannah, about how actually being in these conversations with somebody um, and not getting up from the table um, really right. can change someone's life. And and so I, I, I really hear that. Um, I really hear that. I appreciate that. I also, it makes me remember um, an incident that I had years ago when I was a rabbi in New York in the early days of my rabbinate. And we did this incredible, groundbreaking um, rabbinic conference on, on a justice issue. I think it was about law enforcement, actually, um, and racism in law enforcement. And we had, it, what was so groundbreaking about it was that Orthodox rabbis showed up with Reform, Reconstructionist, and Conservative rabbis. And we were all in the room together, not just modern Orthodox. Like We had some black hat Orthodox rabbis there. And it was incredible that we, were, we could all come together and have this conversation. And then it's time for Mincha, and everybody gets up. And, and I'm like, great, Mincha. And we all walk over to the corner of the room, and they won't start. And Mincha is the afternoon service. And they won't start, and it's super awkward, and we're all wondering why they haven't started. And then I look around and notice that I'm standing in the midst of 30 men, and they aren't starting because I'm there. Oh. Right? And everybody heralded this meeting as, you know, this is Klal Yisrael, like, we can come together and overcome anything. And it's, like, it's, I, I do think there's an element to this, which is, uh, you know, we were learning so much in the last 10, 20 years, like, who's actually in the room and who's not in the room. And... So it does, I think that it's, it's a piece, uh, you talk about how some of your students, um, some of the women graduate students who are working with you are like pushing you to think about also who are the women peacemakers in our tradition and what are the ways that we can look to Bury and others and try to find some of those voices because ultimately this can't be a peace between men. I mean, even it makes me think of Liberia and the way that the women in Liberia like force the hands of the men in making peace because they found a way to see something that the people that the guys at the table couldn't see. My last question before we turn to the group, because um, I know that you've got things that you're, you're curious about. Um, you, you talked a little bit about how you couldn't be the person who is speaking to the, you know, on the news programs because you're already, you're already looked at as, you know, you're modern, you're progressive, you have Hannah, you have, like, you're connected, you've come to Ikar, like, there are all kinds of ways that you're, you know, Pasul already. Um, not exactly, but, um, so I wonder if you can just reflect for a moment on the risk of people, these leaders who you're talking to, jeopardizing their own credibility by even being willing to engage with with you and with each other. Because I know that, I mean, I mean sometimes there's this, you know, it, it takes an incredible act of courage to sort of step outside of the expectations and the boundaries of your own community and open your heart. But, I mean, there was literally after I gave a sermon um, last Shabbos about an encounter that I had with a settler um, Haredi leader, and literally two days later, there was an article in Haaretz about how this rabbi's been canceled for talking to women rabbis. 
and it doesn't mention my name in this one, thankfully. But the point is, that, but they note that he's had a numerous meetings with a couple of us, and now he's canceled. So I wonder if you can just reflect on the risk that some of these guys uh, take in even being willing to talk to each other. And there's probably a very fine line before they before people won't listen to them anymore because of their willingness to engage. That's a great question. Um, it's, I'll say, again, uh, two things come to mind. First of all, um, it's all a question of knowing um, the right person who's then going to engage the right person in the right place in the right time um, so that, you know, it's it's safe for them. Um, but if they know other people in the room, then there's like, okay, then it's then it's okay. Like the mediators in themselves play a role in giving legitimacy that is there. Um, it's also that it's practical. I think that um, when they feel that they can turn around and say that they're actually meeting the needs of their constituencies and that they're solving practical problems, um, that's that's key. Um, it's not just about sitting around and you know going on trips or having dialogues. Like we don't do that. It's very very practical, um, and about advancing their their needs, uh, their values. Um, and the third thing I'll say is that just about every single meeting that I have always starts off with about an hour of stories about Sheikh Abdullah and how brave he was and how. Uh, well, he did it, and then they'll be, a, and then they'll be like, "Well, I'm not as brave as Sheikh Abdullah. I can't, I can't do that. I can't risk that." And then we'll have like this kind of conversation of, "Well, well where are you ready to go?" Um, so the fact that there were some brave people that kind of went forward and didn't care at all, they were fearless in terms of what people were going to say because they were so determined to make this work. I think it sets kind of a, a path forward. Um, and I just want to make a comment about your previous question. The religious piece of issue is not to replace uh, secular peace. It's really not to uh, make a theocracy that will be run by Jewish law and Sharia. I don't want to live in that country. <laughs> That's not what I'm looking for. But it is a question of how do we engage those that are not being engaged. It's not to to be the exclusion. It's to be to the expansion of the of the sense of peace. Um, so I just think it's important both in terms of you know that we don't want to exclude liberal progressive communities. We want to be able to not only have peace be limited to within that very, unfortunately, somewhat shrinking uh, group within the israeli Palestinian context. Can you, add, we're going to take a couple questions, but can you just quickly say what you told me about Oslo and about the meat and the wine? And I just think that's very, um, it's really important. <laughs> a, story, a story, I can't remember who exactly it was, but, but a story was noted by one of the architects of the Oslo peace process saying that he was sitting at a meeting of all the negotiators from the Israeli side, from the Palestinian side, in Spain, and they're all drinking wine and having pig. <laughs> and then he's like, what percentage of Muslims drink wine of Palestinians and eat, you know, pig, and what, and what percentage are they actually representing? And part of that question is, like, they're not engaged especially with not just the, the mainstream of their community but certainly the ones that are most anti the peace process when their voice wasn't being heard and what we're trying to say is how do we give access so that they're part of this so that they're part of that process and they feel that they're then going to not only not sabotage it but will actually make sure to stay stated i am not naive i'm not saying this is possible okay i am saying that if we don't succeed in engaging these communities in the process, in my opinion, no process will work. If the few person in Qatar doesn't write that fatwa or give his bracha, his blessing, to a religious ruling saying, yes, it's from a religious perspective, you could normalize ties with Israel and recognize that as a state, which all these academics are saying is impossible, if he doesn't do that, it will be impossible. But I think the amount of relationship and connections and conversations that we learn about as we, as we go through these Zoom sessions, I think we're a lot closer than people think that think we are. Incredible. Okay, uh, a couple questions before we close. Who, who's got something on your mind? 
with Mincha, I had to leave. Yeah. Yeah, I had to leave. I'm not going to stand in the way of Paul Yisrael. This is like a great moment for the Jews. Yeah. And then we built a car, you know. So, so we could have a place to talk about law enforcement and justice and also Dav and Mincha together. Oh, okay. Um, Scott. And can, if folks can just quickly introduce yourselves as you offer your comments. Yeah, it's hard to say which is the is the ikar, which is the core of the conflict, which is a an, an outgrowth of it. Um, yeah, the question was in terms of settlement uh, expansion and how much are we engaged in that regard and how that affects other aspects of the conflict is what I'm is what I'm hearing from you. Um, so I'll. I'll I think that you're right. I think that the the, 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 the door of the two state solution is people are constantly trying to uh, actively close that and, and certain policies of course are, are closing that. I think that um, I'll say that the rabbis that we engage, the more right wing rabbis, are not in favor of a two state solution. Many of them, some some of them, not all of them, will live in settlements. Um, the Islamic leaders that we're engaged in are all, I mean, the ones who are certainly mediating are very much in favor of the two-state solution. Uh, Rabbi Malker has been a strong advocate for the two-state solution. And part of his his argument of how are we actually going to be able to stop this and not just stop it on a on a temporary level, but on a, but actually we have a game shift, is that if there can be a religious sanctioned peace with the Muslim world, I know this sounds a little bit crazy. It's like the like the last scene of like a Star Wars movie of like when you get the exact you know the exact hit. But as a game changing move, if the Muslim world, I mean not just the you know a liberal Muslim world someplace, but the ones that really have effect, if they're willing to have a shift of the process that's happening in them, our assumption is that there will be more reception. Uh, within the Jewish world that will then be less afraid to stop uh, some of these uh, you know, closing of political solutions. Again, we don't take a direct political stance. Uh, most of our mediators are very strong advocates of the two-state solution and are trying to do everything possible through this avenue to keep it alive. Um, the fatwas that are being discussed are all are generally along the lines of a two-state solution. So a one-state solution or anything else would be a real, would, would open up the whole conversation to a large challenge. But we don't sit there actively like certain organizations trying to stop settlement expansion. What we're trying to do is to get the ones who are deeply engaged in the conversation to, uh, to be thinking differently about what are real solutions. Um, can I, I think, I, if, I, if I may, Scott, I think part of what I'm hearing from Scott is that when there's a, there is a real power imbalance at the heart of this conflict. It's not just a conflict between two, um, with two, between two ideological foes. And so when, it, when Israeli government policy actually has a real impact on the lives of millions of Palestinians, and so there, how does that power dynamic play out when you're, when you're seated at the table with two people representing each of the two communities? I mean, of course, there's a there's a there's a, there's a very significant power dynamic um, that is not ignored. I mean, we deal directly with the, the biggest structural problems uh, and the, the the heart of the conflict. I mean, that's what we're sitting down and discussing. Um, 
I think that when a rabbi who might be advocating for settlement starts to begin to understand from a religious language, um, from a religious leader that he respects, a totally different way of looking at what's happening, that moment of confusion doesn't necessarily mean that he has a solution of saying, now I'm going to change, but bringing that person to a moment of, oh my God, this is really affecting, and this is this should be against some of my own values, I think it's a really, really important first step. Um, so, of course, there are power dynamics. I would say that, again, from a Jewish perspective, the people out there in Qatar who have influence over hundreds of billions of people, they have a, they have a lot of power. Um, it's hard to say, actually, even who has more power in different perceptions of how the dynamic of the conflict is. Um, so, in any given moment, there could be very different power dynamics. Um, also within the mixed cities, you know, there is a huge power discrepancy in terms of who has access to resources and who's, um, and being able to bring that to, to the, you know, the Jewish side to be aware of that and to own that is a, is a really important step that we work hard on. Um, and then you can And that's what we're trying to affect. I mean, we're trying to affect the larger scale of what's happening in the conflict. Um, at the heart and the root of the, of the issue that is often not been tapped into. If we could free up the religious component and have that be a force for change, then we think that some of these policies would be worse changed. And I only engage people that don't agree with me, so. <laughs> okay, so I, we, I see that there are a number of hands. Um, I want to call on Rabbi Dr. Arya Cohen, and then I saw our dear uh, Professor Irene Tucker, and even if you're not a rabbi or doctor, you can also ask a question. Um, but I want to do a quick time check also, because it's 20 of. We originally called this until noon, um, but are people, if people are okay. Okay, so we're going to continue to talk for a few more minutes. Um, we'll go to Arya, Irene, and then we'll The mixed cities, um, as I said, each city is a little bit different, and the and I, I don't want to, um, you know, go too much into kind of the nitty gritty uh, uh, of each one. I have an article that's coming out actually again. I'm not going to my name. This one is I find myself doing more and more. Uh, they go into like what's happening in the dynamic of each city, both in terms of policy and in terms of the dynamics. I will just say in some of these. Not all the Garinim are of the same opinion, just like the same with the southern, with the Islamic movement. Just like there's difference in the southern branch and the northern branch, in my opinion, between them, I found that there's southern branch and northern branch within these religious Zionist communities. Some of them really not coming in in order to uh, Judaize and, and kick out the Arabs. And they actually came 
because they want to strengthen the, the their intention was to strengthen the socioeconomic and um and really the Jewish side of it, but not initially at all in conflict with the Arabs. And they're the ones who are actually running after and saying, we want to have a connection and help. And then you'll have others that are coming at a very different place, and you'll have tension between them with even within the same city. So there's there's different voices that from a distance, they all look the same, the same way I've experienced that the Islamic movement can be seen, oh, you're all Muslim brothers, you're all Hamas. But when you start to look more closely at it, it's actually very, very different. Um, I have a mapping of even on a spectrum of who's kind of more moderate and receptive and can be like an advocate for Arab rights within them, and then vice versa, who in the Islamic side is more open. Um, unfortunately, it's like the more moderate person in one city is with like the more radical leader. Like it just doesn't. I'm like if I could just get a rabbi from this city and the shit from that city, the whole thing would be much more sense. But we're doing a, a, a real study right now of what's happening in terms of the funding, what's happening in terms of policy, what's happening in terms of just the facts, um, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the, the statistics, the numbers, the effect, and, and then the right person presenting that to the different parties and saying, how are you dealing with this? And working with the leadership that goes even above like, sending these people there. Again, the right person engaging them, I think, has a better shot at changing some of these policies. Um, and that's, you know, that's, I, I mean, I'm right now literally helping a friend of mine, a sheikh in, in Lod, change a, uh, a whole campaign. Anyway, afterwards, I'll talk about it. But uh, specifically about building disputes and how we're working behind the scenes and changing policy. But that's exactly what this, hopefully, this new budget, part of what this new budget is supposed to, I mean, there's a structural story happening right now. That, let's see how this plays out. But from the structural down onto the local level, there's, there's a whole bunch of different dynamics that are happening that all of them, in my opinion, need to be engaged simultaneously. We're not ignoring the larger structural issues. Um, I'm going to go to Irene, and then... Oh. I'm hearing two questions. One is, are there non are there non-starters in terms of what? Yes, there are a bunch of them. And then the question is, okay, what are the creative interpretive ways that we go around those? Like Al-Aqsa, okay, Temple Mount. Those are real, nobody is going to, no Jew is going to say no. That isn't the holiest site. And Muslims are going to their whole the whole identity is to be the protectors of Al-Aqsa in that land. So what are we going to do about that? Um, and, and, and having them engage in that conversation and then think pragmatically, what are the boundaries of my realm of interpretation? 
That is not necessarily true in terms of the theoretical possibilities of interpretation, but it is true in terms of the practice of interpretation right now. What is acceptable interpretation today? Um, you know, they're the ones who are going to know how to navigate that in that direct conversation that Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat had no understanding of, of, of the nuances about what are the realms of interpretation. So we have to get the, the people that do have the keys of interpretation with a very significant influence. If, the, if they can sit down and work out a formula that can be as good as possible, I mean, Sheikh Abdullah had a formula for this. He, he used to go around and say, you know, until the Mahdi, or until the Messiah comes, you know, let's try to save bloodshed. But if he comes and he tells me I have to build a Beit Hamikdash, I'll be the first one who will pull, you know, put the put the rock on. But until that, can we be a little pragmatic? Now that's a very the Jews are not there. The Jews are thinking much more messianic, much more redemptive. The Muslims are thinking very pragmatic in this regard. So yes, there are realms. The word shalom. Can they use the word salam, like real peace, religious peace, with the state of Israel, or is it only hudna? Okay, is it only just a ceasefire? Well, you'll have this debate where some saying, no, ceasefire is not an Islamic concept. Hudna is not Islamic, that's Arab, that's not Islamic. Salam is the way to go, and this is what salam is going to mean. And it might mean 50 years. And what does that mean, 50 years? But, but they're struggling with that. That's why there's an interpretive, creative, live conversation that's happening around what are we going to actually do to solve problems. In terms of the coalition, look, I am very happy that there is, please God, going to be a, 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 a budget so that we can get to work and actually solving, you know, real, there are real problems that are going to be solved. That doesn't mean all problems are going to be solved. Um, I think it's an amazing moment of a democratic process of people all trying to be pragmatic. And I think that when people see that you can solve certain, certain levels of problems and there's trust, as I said, there are possibilities, in my opinion, that you can solve a lot bigger problems if the southern branch is not outlawed as a terrorist organization, like some are trying to make it become right now, and they can stay in coalition and conversation like with somebody like Naftali Bennett, and we can pass this. I do think that we will be closer to being able to solve real uh, problems in the Middle East in the conflict than we would be if it was, again, back to, let's say, a very narrow, get your Lapid labor government, which I don't think we would be able to solve it, um, despite what I personally vote. Okay, just, so I, I think that let's take it one step at a time. This is, an, this is a historic precedent, and then let's see where it could go from here. It's really shaky. Like, I don't, I will, I'm not 100% sure it's going to pass on Wednesday, Thursday. We might really find ourselves in elections again. So when I was referring to dialogue, I was talking about like, di like facilitated dialogue groups. Um, so a lot of foundations, governments, invest a tremendous amount of money into having 10 of these, 10 of those meet 10 times. I don't think, and I think that what we see in May, that formula is great for donors. It doesn't work in practice. And it's painful to hear that because we want things that seem to be rational to make sense. But the amount of these kind of dialogue groups that fell apart um, because they weren't trying to, they weren't engaged in actually solving problems. There was a friend of mine who runs a dialogue group, a very, very high level leadership. And there was a crisis around the Tumba and Al-Aqsa. 
And I said, I have the contacts with the police. I'm in touch with the police. I'm in touch with the law. I need you to call this rabbi for me. You're, you have the closest connection. He said, I don't do that. We have an agreement that what happens in the room stays in the room. I said, people are about to get killed. Make the phone call. He said, no, no, we're a dialogue group. We don't engage in what's happening. What happens in the political sphere and what happens in reality, that's not connected to our work. We're having a conversation, which is very, very sophisticated, <laughs> facilitated. And I said, but, but I need you. So it was, a, it was at a moment, that was two years ago, when Tisha B'Av and, and Indeed the Talk, we're always on our holidays over that. Um, he made the phone call at the end. But, but it, he didn't advocate. Because there wasn't that conversation that we're meeting in order to let's get out dirty and let's try to solve practical problems. Um, I'm happy that there's a new Lowy grant that just came out with the U.S. government saying, let's think out of the box in terms of what actual peacemaking looks like. And it's messy. It's not symmetric. It's not always, I don't know when the next meeting, I, I might have to wait a year to be able to get a meeting with a particular person. And it takes tons and tons and tons of trust and solving problems in order to get a meeting with that one person who has incredible influence and one bad thing happens and we head three years backwards because now that person is going to be, but I know that's the person that needs to be engaged. So, of course we're engaging in dialogue, meaning we're having deep conversations. But I mean, like, in terms of, I think that's very important on an educational level, but on a leadership level, we need something beyond dialogue. I'm not saying dialogue it doesn't have a role. It does. It can't be the end of peace building. It has to, we have to, we have to shoot higher than that. Okay, our time is super short. Oh, Rabbi Kesh, are we going to say something? Well, I won't do the PowerPoint. I'll do it in a minute at the very end. I'll take one more question, then I'll... And I'll... Is there one more question? Yeah. Let's do two more questions. What am I going to decide? Maybe, take, <laughs> maybe hear both questions and I'll try to... Okay, let's do that. Why don't you both share your second. questions and... Uh... And Janet? Oh boy, <laughs> how do I do that very fast? Um, there always are moments where we thought we had the right uh, theory and then we're wrong. Um, part of the fun of having 250 graduate students, because uh, I also am a professor of religious peace building, <laughs> is that I constantly am learning models that happen in different parts of the world, applying them, they blow up, and we're like, let's try something different. Uh, and having grad students kind of research about what's working, what's not working. Um, so there's a constant theory, practice, conversation happening all the time. Like what I just presented for, to you about how I think we need to be working in mixed cities, it was different than where I was half a year ago. In terms of what do I think the power dynamics and who needs to be engaged in order to make, how do you get, you know, the government, municipality, police, not just working religious leaders. you got to work holistically with everybody that's part of the power conversation to affect change. So there's constant... Um, where the boundaries are between secular and religious, that's a tough question. Because from the religious, deeply religious leaders, everything is a religious conversation. So, uh, you know, one of my first things that I had to deal with was, uh, and I'm constantly dealing with, is Hamas uh, prisoners, Hamas uh, uh, hunger strike situations. Okay, it was one of my first things I had to do at work. 
after a, a quick temple mount of Aqsa crisis that I had to work on, uh, that we had about 15,000 Hamas prisoners that were going to do a major hunger strike, partly because they wanted the same channels as Fatah had, TV channels. Um, this is not a joke. It was pretty dangerous. This is before the first election. And we found ourselves having to negotiate between the, the head of the Israeli uh, uh, prisoner, you know, and all the way, I won't draw exactly the map so that no one gets into trouble, but let's just say there was a whole group of people that everybody had to pass in on messages, all the way down to the guy who was in his cell in solitary confinement on his iPhone 4, complained that he has no telephone reception. Meaning, I don't know why, he was able to talk on the phone. But those are deeply, are those secular issues or are those religious issues? Meaning, it's not, the religious conversation I'm talking about is not strictly a textual one at all. It's not a religious conversation that's happening in parallel or in a different sphere of reality than the political one. It's very much engaged in the very political, messy aspects of everything happening in conflict all the time. Part of our argument is, is that when you go back to that triangle of where the conflict is at, of the different sides, it's who are the people that are conducting the conversation that are connecting the different parties? And I think just to conclude with, with, my, with, my, with my argument for the, for the book, part of what I try to argue in my book is that any society, and this is, there was an article that just written about me in, in, a, in, a, in the Israeli Journal of Mediation that, that has this quote, Anthropologically speaking, any society that doesn't have a strong sense of insider mediation, of people that are, when two people are in a conflict, immediately two people are constantly, you know, I'm connected to this person, you're connected to that person, let's work together and bring them together. When you don't have those channels of communication, those relationships will become intractable, mm -hmm. anthropologically speaking. Mm -hmm. So what I looked at in the book is what's the history of Jewish community peacemaking? people that were known as Ruth Rachel on peace, pursuers of peace, or, or mediators of peace. Mm -hmm. Rabbis that I, that I share their diaries from 300 years ago and how they acted as peacemakers. What could be learned from their methodologies in terms of pursuing peace within our communities and within the, and within the largest conflicts going on today? And how do we then, as we'll move through the series, how do you now strengthen to have those ties that are not only through the U.S., or through the UN to be able to solve problems, but that people can actually get together and, and, and solve all the problems, not just the religious aspects, also the religious aspects. Um, so I didn't do a, a, a little uh, go through of the, of the book. What I do want to say is that we have um, large gaps of time between each of the four sessions of this series. Uh, we see that as a big advantage because uh, the next session, I think, is December 19th, same time. Okay, just on Zoom, 10 o'clock to 11.30, or 10 o'clock to 11, keep it much more uh, precise. Um, and I'm going to ask people to, to do like a, a, a read of, of a good amount of the book, and, and, and I'll then share about how that's affecting the work that we're doing in terms of violence in the Arab sector, to engaging religious rabbis, religious Zionist rabbis into the work, to the Religious Peace Initiative. And then the second, the third session, I'll ask people to read this booklet, which will go through the eight narratives of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, and, and how there are two narratives, and who's mediating between those narratives. And then, as I said, the fourth session, we'll be doing uh, learning some text about how do we how can we do this in our own context. So thank you all very much. This is incredible. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, and thank you to Rabbi Kasher, um, and, and to Andrea, and to our whole team. Um, as Rabbi Kasher said, we do have the books here, we strongly encourage anybody who's going to be taking the class to get the book. If you um, need some uh, some financial support um, or assistance, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to get the book for anybody who is interested in it um, and and can't afford it. And um, and I just want to uh, close by saying, um, and Marsha, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I saw that you dedicated the book to your father, Larry. Um, I I have to say, every Shabbat uh, when Noah and Enzo are running around. Um, uh, especially during Yekelohenu, but really at any time, um, I feel I feel like our community is um, is really uh, able to somehow feel some of the spirit of your beautiful father um, now through his grandchildren um, and and now through your work as well. And so, as I look at your goodness in the world, Hannah, and your goodness and in, in, in the world, and I don't know your other brother very well, David, but um, I, I suspect he's a force for good in the world too. 
Um, I really, I can see how your father's memory is truly a blessing in the world. And, um, and I thank you for sharing this incredible Torah with all of us. And thank you for your work. And please hope that you stay safe um, and healthy in the days ahead so we can continue to learn from you and to really uh, marvel at the extraordinary, courageous work that you're doing. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. I know there are a few folks who wrote questions on Zoom that we weren't able to get to. So if we can find a way to get people uh, in touch with you in between sessions, I think that would be wonderful as well. Thank you all.